of sociology. He grew up in the village in a village in Zambia, in southern Africa, and was a research fellow at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Zambia. He's a writer, a columnist who has published over a hundred columns, and a storyteller. Perhaps you've seen his op-eds in the DNR yes. once in a while. Yes. Having read those is one reason I'm here tonight. I'm eager to hear what he has to share with us. He's a fr freelance photographer who has sold and used many of his works for il illustrations. He's the author of four books, Tidbits for the Curious, Legends of Africa, The Bridge, and Zambian Traditional Names. Now I think there's a fifth book. Yeah, Tidbits. Yeah, um, that's the basis for your presentation tonight. Oh yeah, Satisfying Zambian Anger for Culture. That would be a, a, a fifth book. And three of his books are on the table, I presume, are for sale, and you'll mention that, you'll talk about that. Yeah. Okay. The southern African country of Zambia, with 72 tribes, has experienced tremendous social turmoil during the last 48 years. The 13 million citizens migrated into the cities and professionals immigrated and scattered abroad in a growing diaspora. The diversity of the Zambian society and globalization has created a cultural crisis, satisfying Zambian hunger for culture, discusses social and political history, gender rites of passage, food, religion, witchcraft, and recommendations for contemporary life in the 21st century. So welcome, Dr. Tembo. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Well, I, I was going to sort of speak just using my mouth, but I, I realized that I, I might need um, some help electronically. Um, I would like to thank uh, Anne Barnes, who is not here today, she's not feeling well, for inviting me, and also Jane Spitzer, Irvin Gleek, and the Virginia Mennonite Retirement Community Lyceum Series for inviting me to address you. Um, I'm, I'm very honored. When uh, she asked me to speak on the topic of women in Zambia, I was very thrilled as I have been very close to girls and women all my life. I even married <laughs> one of them and we have been happy together for the last 33 years and we have three boys who are now grown men. So being very close to women is really at the center of my life to which I believe you also may have had a similar experience. Before I go on, I can be very, it can be very misleading to discuss the topic or share with you what I know without telling you how I came to know this information about African and American women. I've had three major sources of this knowledge. Uh, first, I was born and grew up in a family of nine in rural um, Africa, in the country of Zambia, in southern Africa, in the mid-1950s. I spent half of my life in Zambia. I also obtained my Bachelor of Arts degree at the University of Zambia and conducted extensive research in rural Zambia while working at the University of Zambia as the Institute of African Studies from 1977 to 1989. Secondly, I obtained my Master's and a PhD degrees at um, Michigan State University in Michigan. The reason this is important is that my coursework at MSU and also teaching at Bridgewater College has involved considerable amount of knowledge and scholarship about feminism uh, and women's studies. For example, I taught sociology of the family for five years at Bridgewater College uh, in the mid-1990s. So I'm trying to establish some credibility here because I didn't really just make up this stuff, as you might know, it's, it's been done a lot of reading and some experiences. So I wanted to, you know, to start with a little bit to talk about women in the traditional Zambian family. The experiences of women in traditional Zambia and in Africa is probably represented best by a news item from NBC many years ago. President Bush was conducting a tour of West Africa. One American reporter had a brief story of a young African girl he had encountered in a village 
along one of the rural villages. The TV images showed the young girl sweeping, making a fire, getting a spa, you know, a pot and doing some serious cooking. And this girl was only about eight years old. The reporter expressed near disbelief and shock that such a young girl could perform what were very adult chores, while her American counterparts may be playing videos and any such responsibility may be years away. I smiled at the story with a certain strong sense of familiarity. That's what my sisters did years ago and my young nieces are, are doing, do, doing right now, learning responsibility at a young age. This is described in detail in my book, Satisfying Zambian Hunger for Culture. The chapter on how girls and women are raised was written by two Zambian women, Clara Meaty, who is in the UK, and Ruth Mugala, who lives, um, we used to live in Canada, but she's back in Zambia now. Now, the conclusion I want to share with you is that girls in Zambia and Africa are taught responsibility at an early age compared to their American counterparts today. Besides this, all these rural girls also have to go to school. Girls who live in the urban areas in the middle class will often have house help, which are called house servants in Zambia. The servants perform most of the household chores. The lives of, of girls in lower working class and high population density compounds in urban areas is very close to what rural girls um, experience. Now, this idea of having house help, when my wife and I, my wife who is American, I met at Michigan State, when we lived in Zambia, it was very, very comfortable to have a household and have a nanny who came in every day, did the chores and looked after the babies and my wife and I went to work. People here might say, well, but that is really exploitation. This is maybe like slavery, but over there, that's a tremendous source of employment. People support themselves. If this, if this wasn't there, there could be even worse unemployment. But it also creates a situation in which people who are in the middle class may have a much more comfortable lifestyle. And the girls, and especially their children, may not really have that type of experience of learning how to, to, to do chores very early in their lives. Now, our family of nine when I was growing up had three boys and three girls. My father was a teacher. My sister's experiences in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s are very similar to what girls still experience today in Zambia. The girls go to school, but have to also learn to perform household chores first every day, very early in the morning. The first 12 years of school are open to both girls and boys by law in Zambia. There is no gender discrimination. The literacy rate for females 15 years and older is 74.8% in Zambia and 99% in the United States, in, like in 2011, in terms of the literacy rate there. And now the literacy rate for males 15 years and older is 86.8 in Zambia and 99% in the US. So you might ask, then why the 12 difference in literacy rate between males and females in Zambia? The answer is that even though there is no form of discrimination, girls and women still face challenges or obstacles to getting their education. Some girls are pressured early to, ma to, to marriage by their families. Some are tempted to marry early, maybe due to poverty, a lack of role models, and the general lack of opportunities in third world countries of which women tend to be worse victims than men in general. So I can generally discuss with you various aspects of women's, women's lives in Zambia and in the US and most of these dimensions would show that American women enjoy a much better standard of living and are more empowered, more educated, and have longer lifespans. Most of these you can look up today, uh, up, you know, maybe on the internet, and you can find statistics. But what are some of the aspects of life which may be very different from, what, from that of, say, American women? 
And these, these are the ones I want to talk to you about today. We, I will share with you because they are in the book and I spent so many years writing a book and doing research. So I'll discuss with you four major things that may really be very different for Zambian women compared to American women. Most, we, most women in Zambia, maybe in Africa today, practice what is known as kulanga. Can you say kulanga? Kulanga. kulanga. Then there is also, they practice kuopa. Can you say kuopa? Kuopa. Then, the, then there's also kusungana. Kusungana. And then the fourth one I will talk to you is called chinamwale. Chinamwale. So the reason why um, I want, I'm using the indigenous language instead of the English is that it's very misleading quite often when we hear about African culture or other cultures that translated, in, translated into English, but they're normally, they never really represent the true experiences of the people there. So since I've taught here so many years, you find the anthropologists and other people have gotten this information it's put in all these textbooks, and then you say, well, I think in Africa they do this and they do that, and you, you don't really quite get the real experience. So what I want to do is explain these four very briefly to you, and you see whether you can see they are really very different, or can you identify that maybe there might be some similarities with American culture. So I'll start with uh, my most interesting. It's called Kuopa. Yeah, Kuopa. One of the most important rules and customs that govern some of the family and kinship relationships in the traditional Zambian family is called Kuopa among the Tumbuka, Chewa, Nsenga, and Ngon of Eastern Zambia. What is Kuopa? The word Opa is a noun that translates in English as fear. Huh? Fear, like you're afraid of something, right? Adding the prefix Ku cre creates the word Kuopa, which means to fear. Kuopa is a, a relationship of reverence and special respect that govern certain kinship and family relationship, which is called kulemekeza, to respect someone. When two individuals who occupy social roles that have unique relationship of Kuopa, the customer rules are that the two individuals do not, do not talk directly to each other, or shake hands and stay at least 18 feet or five meters apart from each other or not be in the same small room. So you can't hang out in the living room, you know, a small living room. You have to stay apart. They must gaze away from each other if they happen to meet each other. If they have to communicate verbally, they may briefly say a greeting maybe in one sentence or send a child or another person to communicate the message or greeting to that particular person. So I'm sure you're already thinking, this, this is really bizarre. You know, why, not, why not just talk? And this is what the reaction you get most of the time among Western ed audience. And this has been the case maybe over the last 300 years since Europeans began to go to Africa and other parts of the third world. Kuopa customs apply in the strongest way between father-in-law and daughter-in-law mother-in-law and son-in-law and between a man and all the wives of his younger brothers. Kuopa applies in a milder form between parents and the opposite, se and the opposite sex children who have grown beyond uh, puberty. So this means after the daughter has reached puberty, the father can still chat with the daughter but he's not, he's not to have physical contact in form of horseplay or walk into the daughter's bedroom. The daughter should not walk into the father's bedroom. The same applies to a woman whose son has reached puberty. She cannot chat or talk with him in terms of, uh, in, a, in a very intimate way, but she's not, she, she can still chat or talk with him but she's not to, to have physical contact in form of horseplay or allow him to go into the mother or parents' bedroom. She's not to walk into the son's bedroom. In a traditional Zambian society, the parents' bedroom is out of bounds for all grown children according to the Kuopa custom. So that's why when I came for my master's degree at Michigan State University, that first um, Thanksgiving, 
uh, professor, one of the professors at Michigan State invited me for Thanksgiving to their house. My first time in America, and I, I was being exposed to all these new cultures. So I was shocked when I walked in when they said, oh, we'll show you around the house. And straight away, they led me to their bedroom. They said, oh, here's our bedroom. And I was going, oh my God, I shouldn't be doing this. But I knew this is you know, a different culture. And that's why sometimes people, we tend to assume that what we do, everybody does it. I still, I, I still feel uneasy when I go to a house and somebody says, I'll take you around the house and here's my bedroom. I feel, I feel like I shouldn't be doing this. But that is really comes from that custom of cooper. So cooper in these relationships has never meant being in, in fear, being fearful in the sense of being afraid of something dangerous like a lion, a snake, thunder, a hostile person, or an attack from a violent thug. Western scholars and journalists have distorted the cooper custom because there is no accurate English translation of the term. As a result, the Western society, other foreign scholars and journalists have wrongly called the custom avoidance, segregation, social distance, and other negative descriptions that never really accurately reflect how Zambians themselves actually understand and cherish this custom. Western anthropologists also regard these customs as strange and have called them avoidance customs. In the wisdom of our ancestors in Zambia, they understood full well that the seed, you know, what the seed of familiarity was capable of breeding. So anthropologists, by the way, I want to sort of, you might, some of you might be aware of this already. Anthropologists have described the local or indigenous perspective as the emic perspective. And then the scientific or outsider's view is known as the etic. So if they come to you to study your habits in your house, what you interpret as being, well, this is what is happening between me and my wife or my kids, that is your emic. But then the scientific is the one of the external supposedly scientific interpretation. And I've come to realize, I've concluded in my own recently that <coughs> that scientific interpretation is said to be superior, but I don't think it is, because I think it just serves to distort what people are really experiencing. So I really, to me, seriously challenge that assumption because it gives credence to belittling other cultures and because you say, well, I'm scientific, I'm more clever, I can tell what's going on, but no, you can't. So that Kuopa custom, for example, is cherished by the people, they enjoy it, and they express a, a sense of dignity while they practice it. But who am I, even me as a scholar, to say, well, you can't be feeling that. All it is is just, you know, it's just some funny custom. You should just communicate directly and that's it. Forget all these customs, they're just funny. Let's strip them. And usually there's been a drive, drive from Western society since the Industrial Revolution when they went to other societies to really remove these primitive customs. And I think it's not really good. So in general, I am convinced that all human beings have hunger for culture in the sense that you want to feel connected to other people. You want to feel a sense of dignity and a sense of respect, a sense of order, a sense of, uh, of control. We all yearn that because that's what defines us as human beings. You can't ask an elephant, at least as far as I know, an elephant or a dog may have, but we human beings seem to have that sense of feeling, okay, I am with Zenge, and this particular person here is my friend, and the way we interact, that sense of dignity, is maintained through some of these customs. And Kuopa is just one of those customs. My own feeling about this is that the Kuopa custom, especially among the close in-laws, son-in-law and you know, mother-in-law, uh, father-in-law and the daughter-in-law, those relationships are really fraught with lots of tension. So the Kuopa customs really help to relieve that tension. That is, that's why I'm saying, you know, I've experienced this too since I've been married. I've always noticed that between those in-laws, there's really in, very inherent tension. And these customs help to alleviate them. It's tough enough among human beings to get along every day. You have emotions of jealousy, you, you are mad, or you, you want to hug them, or you want to have sex with them. So all those attractions and tensions, these customs help to really 
keep things you know under control otherwise things just become you know really chaotic so that is one custom that is really practiced among the women there which may be really different from the women over here I may want to listen to you later on maybe when we have questions to find out uh, all, uh, your experiences with your in-laws maybe even when you were younger married was it really happy-go-lucky where you were just saying hey high five hey how are you and what not or did you ever notice there was, there's always a little bit of that tension and uh, those cultures in, in Africa and elsewhere traditional cultures really try to take care of that and I think it's a very, something that is very valuable <coughs>